black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Zia! Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. We're going to be talking to Norm, and Norm is a retired uh, California Highway Patrolman, uh, and he had an encounter back in, I believe it was 1958, on his uh, father's property out there in California, and it this is before the Patterson-Gimlin film, this is before a lot of people were talking about Sasquatch outside of the Native Americans, and uh, the encounter always bothered Norm, he, ne- he was never really sure what he saw that day. And it's kind of fascinating to talk to someone in that time period and then 10 years later ask him, what did you think when he saw the Patterson Gimlin film? Uh, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Norm to the show. Norm, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks a lot, Wes. Appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate being here. And I know uh, you had quite the encounter. Um, and this happened many, many years ago out there in California. Um, I believe it was, what, the 50s, wasn't it, Norm? 58. 58. July of 58. I was, uh, I'm 75 now. I was about uh, 14 or 15 at the time. Okay. And a uh, long time ago. All right. Well, perfect. If you would take us back to that moment. Um, I know we talked a little bit about it last night, but I'm excited to hear the full encounter. Uh, if you would take us back to that moment, kind of tell us what you were doing. Uh, feel free to share any information you want about the area and, and walk us into what happened. The Walnut Ranch where this occurred um, is in Lake County in Northern California. It's about 120 miles north of San Francisco about 130 miles west of Sacramento. And it's up in a it's up in a mountainous area, lots of brush land, a lot of forest, pine forest. And so this uh, walnut orchard project that my dad was a general manager of was created out of all this very high, thick uh, brush land. And the area is uh, very volcanic. Uh, volcanic soil, volcanic rocks, that kind of thing. It's very um, so they they carved this orchard out of a out of a pretty rough rough area, but the ranch is surrounded on all sides by you know some very very uh, dense uh, brush that I, I you know I don't know what lives out there. You know deer. We had a lot of deer and stuff like that. But anyway, the um, I grew up on this ranch and. Uh, I, I lived there f- from the time I was four and a half years old until I went off to college at age 18. And uh, my, my dad um, engineered this whole ranch and it, it, uh, there, the, the irrigation system was, was um, really a difficult thing for him to, to, uh, to put together. And so he uh, had this plan uh, eventually that he was going to irrigate the orchard 24 hours a day, seven days a week, starting in May and shutting it off, shutting off the 
irrigation system in September. So he started hiring people from the local town of Kelseyville and Lower Lake and places like that. And um, these people didn't work out very well. They were not very reliable. They they were out there, you know, and they didn't do a very good job. They were drinking on the job. They never showed up for work. And so my dad had a really a lot of problems with these guys. So he fired them all and uh, really thought he probably was going to give up on his 24-hour irrigation project when my brother and I thought that, you know, every summer we worked on the ranch and we thought if we could talk him into letting us letting us just manage the irrigation system and he just would not have anything uh, to worry about, he just just let us do it, then we would, we'd make more money and we could set our own schedule and do whatever we wanted to do in our off time. And so we approached him and eventually after about a day or so, he said, yeah, yeah, you guys can go try it, see how it worked out. He saw that we could do it. So we're out there in the middle of the night, two, three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes we get up, we go out and we just move this irrigation pipe all through the orchard. And, um, and so on this particular evening, it was probably around 7.30 in the evening and the sun, sun had just kind of gone down or behind the hills. And we were all done um, moving the irrigation pipe and what we were doing, and we had a friend with us that also worked with us, a guy by the name of Jack. He was about our age. And so we were in this old Chevy pickup, old 41 Chevy pickup that my dad had. And uh, we were just driving around the the ranch, and we were just looking at the irrigation system to make sure the sprinklers were not plugged up, that the lines were not blowing apart and all that kind of stuff. And I came down to this one corner of, it was kind of an intersection. Our our orchard was laid out. The 500 acres was laid out in 40 and 55 acre kind of plots, and um, kind of, and so each 40 acre uh, parcel of walnut orchard was uh, a quarter of a mile square, 320 feet on all four sides, and if you went a diagonally across the the 40 acre field is about 1,870 feet. And this part of the orchard was uh, pretty flat at, at the bottom where we, we, where we spotted this creature, but at the top where it eventually went, it got very steep. It got up to like 15% grade and uh, it, was very, it was very steep. And uh, because there was a lot of uh, irrigation going on in there, it was, it was muddy in there too. But anyway, to just, back up a little bit we were coming down this road we made a right turn at this intersection there was not supposed to be anybody in the orchard there's not going to be anybody on the ranch all the hired hands there are about five of them they went home at five o'clock mom and dad are our home on the ranch and the ranch house and we came around this intersection and we see something on two legs a bipedal creature of some kind didn't know what it was man what didn't know what it was was walking through the orchard it was about maybe 75 feet maybe 100 feet back in the orchard so we couldn't see anything but just about the knees down or thereabouts so i kind of pulled the truck around to try to get a better look at at what what was walking out there and before we could identify this thing or even get a full look at it, it took off running. So I could see that the animal or the creature or whatever we thought it was at the time was taking off at a diagonal across the uh, this particular 40-acre field. And so I accelerated this old Chevy truck, and I had to. I couldn't drive through the orchard just wet and plowed field and it just gets stuck. So I had to use the farm roads. So I went all the way down, had to drive a quarter of a mile down to the, where our barns are, turn right and go up this very steep hill to try to see if I could intercept, you know, this uh, this thing that we saw running through the orchard. And so the whole time I was driving and trying to get to a place where we could get a better look at what this thing might be, my brother and this guy, Jack, this kid, Jack, were uh, kind of keeping me informed about the location of the, and the progress of this thing as it as it came across the orchard. 
So we got about halfway or maybe two thirds of the way up the hill. And at the top of the hill was another intersection where more 40 acre parcels came together. And we just stopped the truck and we got out. And between us and the orchard was a, a really wide uh, drainage ditch that uh, was probably 10 or 12 feet wide and maybe 15, 20 feet wide at that point, probably. And this thing came running up the hill and we stood there. What we thought, it, what we thought was coming through the orchard was a man. And the reason we thought that in the beginning is because about a mile and a half or mile and three quarters or so to the uh, kind of the east of us was a forestry fire camp. And this fire camp was was uh, made up of uh, uh, inmates, convicts from San Quentin uh, prison in the San Francisco Bay Area. They were nonviolent offenders. And they used them, they were kind of like trustees, and they used them to fight fire. And they, they were pretty they were pretty successful at doing that. They, they actually probably outworked the employees in the fire camp. But that's who we thought it was because there was, there was, we had a history of these guys running off from the fire camp. And they would run across our property and they would try to get to the nearest town of Kelseyville or Lower Lake or whatever, you know, and somehow, you know, hide in somebody's trunk. Now, we're talking about the 50s now where, you know, we had a lot of old cars where you just turned a handle and you lifted the hand, the, the trunk lid and you just climb in. And there were a couple of uh, cases of adjacent ranches where when the women uh, went to town, uh, they tr unknowingly transported a convict in the trunk of their car, got to town, they jumped out and run around with their orange suit on, I guess. So that's kind of what we thought was going to be coming up the hill. But when we saw this thing, and it was about seven or eight feet tall, it looked to me like an it like the, it had facial features like a like a an Indian, not the Indians of California. Uh, in my area, but the Indians of the middle part of the United States. And so this thing, we could hear, we could hear this thing coming because he was huffing and puffing because it's really a steep hill. And this, this creature, seven, eight feet tall, co completely covered with hair, could see no ears. It looked like the shoulders just went up and met the top side of the head, but it had it had um, a kind of a rounded head. It had uh, a, a kind of a broad, but long, long nose. It was kind of hooded like a like a human, and it had um, it had thinner lips uh, than than other f photographs that I've seen of of these things, and it did not have a, a this big barrel chest that uh, so many um, of the witnesses on your show, Wes, uh, report. This thing was uh, more lean. You know, it probably weighed about 500 or maybe more pounds, but it was, it didn't have this great big, I mean, it was bigger than Hulk Hogan and, and guys like that. Don't get me wrong. This thing was huge, but it, it just didn't have this, this massive uh, chest. And I, and I, you know, and some people have reported that, you know, it had like five foot wide shoulders and this, this, this creature was, was not quite that wide. I would say maybe four, four feet at, at the most arms hung down to below the knees. And this thing's as it was running, it, its arms were, were really, uh, were really swinging in a, in a, like a 180 degree arc. And, um, it, it, as it came up the hill and it got into the top part of the orchard where the where the trees were a little smaller because the soil isn't quite quite as uh, as good as down down at the bottom of the of the hill why we could see it a lot better because it was running through smaller trees and it looked directly at us and when it did that my brother and and Jack they wanted to get the heck out of there get in the truck, let's get the heck out of there. I wanted to see where this thing was going because it, it looked to me 
like it was on a mission to go from point A to point B without any interruption and without any real interaction with with any anybody else. And so when we when we when it was coming up the hill and we looked at this thing, it never it never showed its teeth. It never made any noise other than just what just heavy breathing and just a little bit of the sound of of of, uh, of its footfalls. But that uh, but not much but not much there because the orchard was was cultivated and so it's not running on it's not running on on uh, firm soil on firm ground. It's running in plowed ground that's probably eight to 10 inches deep it plowed. So not easy going for anybody, including this, this creature. When we looked at this thing, we had no idea what we were, what we were looking at. We, we had no frame of reference of that. I never heard of a Sasquatch. I never heard of a Bigfoot. I never heard of anything that even uh, closely resembled this thing. There was nothing ever uh, mentioned in school. None of my friends, none of no adult that I'd ever uh, listened to ever mentioned anything about a creature like what we saw that 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 evening. And it's it 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 turned and looked at us. And the impression that I got is it kind of grinned at us, but it showed no teeth. And that's when everybody wanted to jump in the truck and just, you know, skedaddle out of there. So when it went by. I jumped, we jumped back in the truck and we took up, keep in mind, we got this old 41 Chevy with a 60 uh, horsepower, six cylinder engine. We're not talking about a muscle car here. And so we took off and I tried, I tried to catch up to it, get a better look. Everybody, my brother and Jack were telling, you know, they don't want to get too close to this thing because they, they were afraid. And uh, frankly, I, I, I didn't, I didn't feel that way. I, it was creepy. To see this thing, it was creepy when it kind of grinned or whatever it did. That kind of creeped us out. But it, but I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I was threatened. It didn't make any gesture. It didn't make any movement, any furtive movement of any kind that really would indicate, hey, I'm going to come over and just rip you to pieces. Never had that feeling ever in that during this encounter. So we took off up the hill in the old Chevy, grinding up this steep hill, and we closed on this thing to about i want to say 100 to 150 feet when it finally came out of the field and crossed a pretty pretty large intersection where all these fields and, and branch roads come together and when it came across that road and that intersection it turned and looked back at us and when it did it 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 just had to it had to kind of torque its whole body uh, around so that it could. I mean, when I wrote uh, when I wrote to you, Wes, I I think I I said you know it kind of looked over its left shoulder, sorta. And but but that wasn't. I mean, it it couldn't turn its head. I don't know why these things are are built the way they are. I don't know what the what that design you know is um, is made for. I, I really don't know. But it it had to turn its entire body to to look around. And so it's 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 left shoulder and everything all turned and uh, and just twisted around. And when it did that, it slowed down. And so we got got a little bit closer. And uh, so we were just looking at this thing, and it took off into another forty acre uh, parcel on our ranch. And so plowed ground. I can't drive out there with this little two wheel drive pickup. It gets stuck. So I have to, I, I want to try, I'm, I'm looking at this thing. It appears that it's going to run across this thing on a diagonal again, for some reason. So I go down these ranch roads. I go all the way around. Got to go a quarter mile this way, quarter mile that way to get around so I can see this thing. And finally, when it came out of the orchard and crossed the farm road that we were on, we got another pretty good look at it and how it, how it ran. and. It, I wouldn't say, I don't remember that it looked like it was gliding because some people talk about how these things look like they're gliding. Um, it, it wasn't really like that, although it, 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 it did not bend its, uh, 
it did not bend its uh, knees. It's like it's like Patty, you know, when she ran. It that no, the knees were were bent. You know, they didn't. They're not straight like a human. And so it ran across the road in front of us. And at that point, we were uh, right at the base of a hill, and um, it ran across the road, and uh, it ran into a, a, a property owned by the Wiper family. And not anymore. It's all grapes by some other other vintner that bought up all the land up there. But at that point, it was owned by a private uh, a family, and it ran through their their the, the area in front of their barns and their shop. And of course, there was nobody there. And it ran uh, through between the barns and and the shop, and uh, through about another couple of hundred feet of their orchard, which was walnuts also. And then it just ran into um, into the brushland, into this into this brush that's 10, 15, 20 feet high, and you know, very difficult for a man to even walk through it. And this thing just plowed through it like like nothing uh, nothing could stop it. So we went, when we lost sight of it, we went back to where we originally saw this thing. And that part of the orchard right there where we saw it had just been irrigated within the last day or two, and so it was still pretty wet. And uh, all this ground is volcanic, and it just gets real muddy when it, uh, and, uh, and just soggy, and it's almost like, it's almost like clay, you know, almost pulls your boots off, you know, when you walk through it. This thing ran through there. And so, you know, we're just kids, you know, we're not thinking about trying to get a cast of some of some foot or or try to figure out what kind of footprint this thing is leaving. We just never thought about that. It's not even in our in our minds. But we did look and see how how wide the um, the stride was. And it, the stride at the bottom of the hill, and it may have shortened a little bit at the top, was about 25 feet. Each step was about 25 feet. So that meant the orchard was laid out in a way that the rows of trees were 50 feet apart. And so it cleared an entire uh, row between two, walnut, two uh, rows of walnut trees in, in about two steps. And it continued that 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 pace all the way up the hill and i i'm pretty sure that it it wasn't taking a 25 foot stride maybe at the top of the hill but pretty close to it so a few weeks ago i calculated um that at 25 foot st- at, at a stride of 25 foot it that that creature would would have been able to navigate that 40 acre field in a diagonal direction, 1,870 feet in about 60 or 70, maybe 80 steps. That's all. And it did that in probably 70 seconds. That's about the time it took for that thing to cross 1,870 feet of diagonal orchard and that works out to 31 feet a second or about an average speed of about 21 miles an hour but when it crossed when it got to the top of the hill then then the orchard flattened out a little bit for probably a couple of hundred yards and then it dropped off into about a a 12 to 15 degree downhill grade and the creature was actually it it the speed of the creature actually increased a little bit as it went down this hill it was it looked like it was on a mission it looked like it knew where it was going i have no idea where it was going all all there was all there was in the direction that it was running was the fire camp uh and another and a and a small cattle ranch that was about another mile and a half away and then beyond that, it was just for a pine forest and just uh, brush land that hadn't burned in probably a hundred years. And some of that brush land, some of the brush was in those, some of those areas was like 30, 40 feet high. So it just plowed through that stuff. 
uh, it was um, it was amazing. So we had a little powwow, my brother and um, Jack and I, and we were going to go tell my dad what we saw because we were pretty upset and pretty pretty confused about what we saw because we just couldn't couldn't put it in a category because it just didn't fit anything. And uh, and then um, we continued to kind of ride around the ranch, check more of the sprinkler system. We we're talking about it. We decided, no, we're not going to tell my, we're not going to tell my dad. And the reason we decided to do that is because we my dad paid us pretty well to do this job of moving irrigation pipe 24 hours a day all summer long, seven days a week. And we didn't want to lose that job. And we're just we're just young teenagers. And if we thought that if he felt that it was too dangerous for us to be out there two, three o'clock in the morning with a headlamp on our head like a miner moving irrigation pipe around through the orchard, we thought we were going to lose our job. So we never we never told anybody ever. And my my brother died in 1978. And I have no idea where Jack is, but uh, my brother was an engineer for Halliburton and was killed in a gas well explosion. So to my knowledge, he never, never told the story to anybody. We just kept it to ourselves. About a year later, we kind of, we kind of forgot about this. We kind of put it in the back of our mind, but I'll tell you this, every time for quite a long while, every time we went out in the middle of the night, to try to to move to irrigation pipe, I always I always had this feeling. I think I must be an I might have been imagining it because over active imagination, but I always felt that I was like I wasn't alone, you know. And, and so I I'm I was always flashing my headlight around to see what was around me to make sure there was nothing sneaking up behind me, and and there never was. And so after we after we had that job in the summer for years and years until we went off to college, why we never had another encounter uh, like that, never saw anything again like that, and didn't want to see really anything like that. About a year and a half after this encounter, um, my dad, who uh, subscribed to uh, True Magazine, read an article about uh, Jerry Crew. And his uh, infamous um, uh, encounters up in the Three Rivers National Forest, up in the Trinity Trinity Alps, up there, um, over there by uh, Yreka and Eureka, and over that way. And uh, they, True Magazine, wrote an article about his encounters, and my dad read that and kind of was talking about it, I guess. And and so you know when he put the magazine down. I'm a, I'm a year older. I, I picked it up and I start reading about this thing. And then later I see pictures uh, that had been published in newspapers in the local area around Willow Creek and places like that. And when I saw some of this stuff and I read this article of the, about Jerry Cruz uh, encounters, then I knew I knew what I saw. I knew that I'd seen a Bigfoot and I knew exactly what it was that uh, that that I saw that night. When I went to college, I had a couple of buddies who were criminal justice uh, students. They one later became a deputy sheriff up in Humboldt County, I think, and the other became a California Highway Patrolman in Mendocino County. And I later became a California Highway Patrolman myself later on in life after I got out of the military. But in college, we're sitting around. These two guys and I are sitting around. And we're just we're just uh, having a few beers, you know, 19 years old, having a few beers. And they, I asked them, I said, where you guys live, have you ever seen one of these Bigfoot creatures? And I don't think they ever did, but they talked about a couple of encounters where they were deer hunting up in that area around Willow Creek. And they had their hunting dogs and, and they ended up and there was all this, they smell these things. These creatures were throwing rocks at them, throwing tree limbs at them. The dogs were frightened to death. And, you know, and in both encounters, I guess they 
they said they they packed up the following morning, got the heck out of where they where they were. So it was probably a year after the encounter that um, it was around the same time. I think that the um, maybe the article came out in True Magazine that um, my dad, um, my dad's younger brother was a general manager on a large sheep ranch in Sonoma County. And it was very remote, 4,000 acres. It was owned by a Hollywood producer. And they they raised sheep originally back around the 1900s. Or it was a racehorses there. And it's very mountainous and very rugged and very damp and foggy all the time because of its proximity to the Pacific Ocean. So my dad goes up there to hunt wild hogs with my uncle and a bunch of other people, my brother and I, we'd love to go, but we had to stay and work on the ranch. So he goes up there and they kill a bunch of hogs and they're the kind of a combination of feral hog and, and um, Russian razorback hogs, really, really nasty, uh, mean, ornery things with a head like a piece of concrete. And so they killed a bunch of these hogs. They're probably four or 500 pounds, some of them. And so my dad came home with a couple of slabs of uh, meat. They were about 100 pounds each. And so he went out on the backside of our house and he put these two great big, um, kind of a big lag screw, big hook. He screwed them into the end of the roof rafters. And then he hung these pieces of meat on these two big hooks and just let them hang out there at night in the cool air and kind of cure that way. And then in the morning, he'd go out, take them off the hooks, wrap them up in a, an old sheet or something he had, and then put them in an old sleeping bag, and they would slide them under their bed in their bedroom. Then at night, he would take them out of the sleeping bag and put them back up on the hooks. And that process went on for a couple of nights until he finally went out there one morning to remove these uh, pieces of uh, wild hog meat off these hooks. Keep in mind now, the roof rafters and these hooks are about 10 and a half and 11 feet off the ground because that's the downside of, of, our, of the property where, our, where the ranch house was uh, built on. So we had a lot of dogs. We had five, five, six dogs mostly all the time. So my dad goes out there and the meat is gone. I mean, it is just vanished. And he comes back in and he's, you know, my brother and I were getting ready to go to school, I guess, and, and uh, having breakfast or something. And he said, the meat is gone. So we all go out there. Yep, it's all gone. We look at the hooks. There's no, there's no little shards of meat on there where something just reached up there, grabbed it, and just pulled it off the hook. The hooks weren't bent. There was no... There was no meat on the ground. We had coyotes in the area. They make a huge mess. They tear everything to pieces. And uh, there was no, There was no evidence that it was that. We don't have wolves in Lake County. It just never. And, and black bears, very, very rare in, in that area where we were. In all my life, I never saw a black bear around where our ranch was. So... My dad figured the dogs must have gotten it, must have jumped up there, grabbed on it. and But there was no drag marks. There was nothing. And when my dad called all our dogs over to the place below where this meat had been hanging, dogs didn't want to go there. And he couldn't coax them. He couldn't coax them into that area for some reason. And I just, when I remember back, I just, I just found that to be so odd and fascinating that these the, the dogs just they never made a sound all night because if there was anything if a coyote, a coyote went through there or a deer went through there those dogs went crazy they would chase it and they would bark and, and wake you up but the night that this meat came out missing not a sound but dogs did not make a peep so what happened to the meat Maybe, maybe that Sasquatch that we saw, you know, came back and had a little snack. I, I, I don't really know. Yeah, I've had other friends that have had other counters and it's, uh, and I, I'm a firm believer in these things. I, I, I know they exist. 
uh, I've I have believed in them, uh, uh, you know, in their existence all my all my adult life, and uh, and I have so many of my friends that uh, work in Northern California that have seen these things. Law enforcement guys that are working up in the Weaverville area. You know, they had a big fire up there one time and it was fire was moving at about 35, 40 miles an hour. Every animal was was running for their life. And this friend of mine, uh, highway patrol, highway patrolman, he's retired now. He found tracks in the highway, state highway. And it's about an 80, 80 foot to go across that highway. And these animals cleared it in no, no, two, two and a half steps or something like that. So they're running. Everybody's running for their life. So. They're in Northern California. They're very elusive, I'm sure, and um, I don't care to really come across one. I, I feel very fortunate that the encounter that I had was um, very uneventful in terms of threat to my safety. So, yeah, I mean, what a, what a life you've lived, and uh, especially having the encounter that you had. I wanted to ask you, God, I got so many questions for you about that meat. I mean, 11 feet up and that meat is just gone. You and I both know that if dogs or wolves, I know you said there's no wolves, but even a cougar, it would have been a mess. I mean, you guys would have seen a mess. And from what you describe, it sounds like something just kind of walked up, popped it off the hook and walked off. Something, something very, I mean, when my dad would take this stuff off the hook, he had a step ladder, you know, to to get up there, and uh, and because it was uh, like ten and a half, eleven feet off the ground, so you know, he had, you couldn't just. He, my dad was only like five eight and a half, five nine, so he wasn't a big guy. So you know, he just he couldn't reach up there and grab it, and uh, so what 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 other thing just comes to mind, you know? And it's this, you know, and. That whole back part of our of our of our behind our house was all gravel. My mom had a, a clothesline out there, and so there was all gravel. And it was concrete sidewalks right where below where this thing where this meat was hanging. So there were no there were no there were no tracks or no footsteps. It was just you know. And even after my dad read this article in True Magazine, I don't I don't really know if he ever you know put two and two together because he never said anything. He never said anything to, to any of us. And of course we never said anything about what we saw, you know? Yeah. It's fascinating. I remember you and I were talking yesterday. And I was telling you, Bob Gimlin was telling me about true magazine and some of the things that they'd put in the magazine regarding Bigfoot. I wanted to ask you going back to your encounter, um, yeah. describing the creature, I know you had mentioned Indian. So would you say it looked more human like when you were looking at this thing as opposed to, cause you've yeah. heard the show Norman and, and sometimes people oh, yeah. say, well, it looks, looked like an ape. It looked like a monkey. Uh, it looked like a chimpanzee. It looked, and then you get some people that say, no, it looked very human. Like when you were describing the face, would you put it more in a human category or would you put it more I, in I, an animal? No, I no, I put it in the I put it in the human category, but the body, the body of this thing, uh, is 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 not human. It's something else. It's some other kind of hominid, you know that 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 you know some relic hominid from some some part of our our past, you know. We you know who who knows, you know the 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 the, the native Indians, the first people. First Nation people, I mean, they they've been talking about this stuff in their culture for thousands of years, you know. And some of them, some of the tribes call them people. Other tribes don't uh, don't uh, want to be around them. This this thing had a face. It was a very large face. I mean, it was a, this thing was a huge person, or person, if you want to call it that. It was a huge creature, and. Um, but it had a, it had a very, it, when you sent me, I had, I found online a, 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 a drawing of one of these creatures and it was very much like what you sent me in, in, uh, in an email. And, but except the thing that I couldn't, I never could find, I didn't seem to find the round head like this thing had. And it, the one I, 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 the, that I saw, but what you sent me was so close 
to uh, what I saw. The only thing that I I I don't remember in, in the picture you sent me, it looked like the creature that in that drawing, the hair was parted in the middle, and and it looked like it fell, or you know, for lack of a better term, it combed or over you know each each side of its head. I don't remember the creature that I saw having that kind of hair. I, I, I remember it was much shorter and it was the, the, the hairline came down, uh, more, to, uh, closer to the, to the brow line. Uh, but other than that, the lips were kind of th are thin like that. Um, I don't know about the teeth because it never showed me the teeth. Um, but, uh, it, it looked, it just looked like, it was a cross between some great big hairy thing with long arms and huge feet and, uh, and, and this human type face, you know? Yeah. And for, the, mean, yeah. And, and for the audience listening, I sent him the Mike Woolley. I'll throw it underneath this episode. Uh, but I remember first time I interviewed Mike Woolley, you and I talked about this norm. I was telling right. you, he said, it looks very human like in the face. The rest of the body was not human, but it looked no. very human like in the face. Right. Um, the other part that I find fascinating about your encounter um, is you got to see the expression change. And correct me if I'm wrong, but at first, in, it didn't seem like it was a big deal that you guys were that close. And then when it realized you guys were following it, uh, did the expression change at all? It did. It, it When we stopped the truck, on that, on the hillside, uh, you know, and we were kind of separated from this thing with a, with this huge, uh, uh, drainage ditch and, uh, and about maybe a hundred feet or 75 feet of uh, orchard. When it came through there, it was huffing and puffing and it, and it, I don't, it, it was kind of looking down. I don't think it really saw us, uh, right away. Uh, I think it, it may have, it may have uh, uh, thought that it, it had eluded us or evaded us somehow. And all of a sudden, there we were, you know, just standing there by the front, right front fender of the truck, looking at this thing, huffing and puffing like a freight train coming up this hill. And when it saw us, it turned kind of slightly. And it just kind of, it looked like a smile or something like it, it, just, it was creepy. It scared, it scared my brother and it scared, um, it scared, uh, my, my buddy Jack and, uh, and they wanted to get, they didn't want any more part of that thing. That's it. We're over. Let's get the heck out of here. Listen, you know, I'm, I've had enough, but I, I kept following this thing and, um, uh, and you know, when it turned its body around in that intersection, uh, to look back over, back left to see uh, how close we were behind it, because it could hear us. Obviously, the truck was making a whole bunch of racket coming up that hill in in second gear, so it knew we were we were uh, pursuing it, and it kind of it it slowed down when it when it went through the intersection when it when it started to look backwards. It kind of slowed down a little bit, but then once it entered the next. Uh, 40 acre uh, orchard piece it the pace picked up again and uh, and then it kind of it was level for a little while a couple hundred yards i guess and then it just dropped off into that 15 degree downhill and it kind of took off there it, maybe doing 30 35 miles an hour i don't really know it was taking some very long strides and moving pretty quick i had to really hustle in that old truck to get around there to actually see it. It crossed, it crossed in front. When we got down there by the wiper ranch, their barns and stuff, our, our ranch roads kind of intersected their ranch roads and it crossed the road in front of us. I want to say we were probably 75 or hundred feet away from that thing. And, um, uh, it was. It never looked back at us again. I'm. I'm sure that it was probably looking at us off and on as it was coming down through the orchard because it could hear the. It could hear the truck. I'm sure truck had you know kind of an old straight pipe on it, and uh, but it didn't really give us. It didn't really give us uh, any notice. I mean, it didn't really seem to be uh, concerned about who we were and what we were doing. It just had this mission of getting to where it wanted to go and 
And that's what it was doing. It's kind of weird, you know. It didn't deviate. My my brother and I were they they were Jack and, and and my brother they were they were younger than me by you know a couple of years and uh, they they were not they, they really they were not they were not very pleased with me uh, going when I it. when I continued pursuing it they weren't you know they yeah. they they were they the the, lang- the language and the tone of voice in the cab of the truck was elevated because they weren't happy. They wanted to, they wanted to break it off. They'd had enough, you know, can I ask you, so 10 years later, the Patterson Gimlin film comes out. How did you feel when that came out? You know, I, I, I looked at that. I looked at, I, I read the whole thing about, you know, how, um, how Bob, how, how about Patterson, Roger Patterson, you know, he was a, he was a, he was a good horseman. These guys, these guys rode in the rodeos. These guys are, are, are not some weekend, uh, horse, horse people. And they're riding in some very rough country. And when I, when they, when, when Patterson got off his horse, well, actually got thrown off and, but had the presence to grab his camera on the way off, his horse ran off and, you know, went down the canyon about a quarter of a mile, I guess. But he got really good film, and I, I that was just I th- I just that was fascinating. That um, that was in 1968, and I that's the year I went on the highway patrol, and uh, so I saw that, and uh, I just never said anything to anybody. Uh, I wasn't going to say anything to anybody about this encounter ever while I was a police officer, because that just, it, it's, it felt to me like that was just a career buster and wasn't going to, wasn't going to go there, but yeah. I, it was confirmation for me. I said, you know what? I, I saw something very much like, like Patty, different, different, different face. Patty had, um, it didn't even look like a female face, you know, to me, when I, when I look back at that, that film, it, it looked, it, it looked like a, it should be on a, a, a male Sasquatch and not a, and not a female, but obviously it's a female. Cause you see the breasts of the thing. The one thing that I, I found fascinating about that, and I think it was F Meldrum pointed it out that on closer examination of Patty as she was, well, she wasn't exactly running, but she was stepping out pretty, pretty, uh, pretty smartly there, that there was a, a ruptured, uh, a ruptured tendon or maybe a muscle in, in her, in her uh, right uh, thigh. And, uh, I guess on closer examination, you, when she would move it a certain way or take a step in a certain way, it would bulge. And then it would retract, and that that looked like it should be extremely uh, painful because it, it was some kind of injury that she had, you know, in, encountered. But it, I guess, it turned out that there was a, a juvenile somewhere hiding nearby, and she was trying to possibly lure um, uh, Patterson and Gimlin uh, away from uh, from that area. But they had they had the good sense not to follow her. Because that that might not have ended well either. Because I guess where she was going, there was more of them. But um, as far as I remember, yeah, it's but, interesting you bring that up, Norm. I mean, I I laughed when he said that because I've always thought that Patty has a face only a mother could love. Um, I'm telling you, she was <laughs> she was she was uglier than she was yeah. uglier in a mud fence. I'm telling you, she was really really <laughs> ugly. I mean, how would you like to have that for a girlfriend? You know. Yeah, I hear totally. <laughs> I mean that that that, but you know the way she walked, the way she, I mean the way the knees didn't bend, how how they're kind of bent forward a little bit. That's how they that's how they that's how they travel. And uh, I sent I sent Doctor Meldrum uh, an email. Um, he had, he answered my first email and then told me that his wife tried to join the California Highway Patrol and. That didn't, I guess it didn't work out for her, but I talked to him, I sent him an email and I wanted to know what, what is, what is the advantage of a creature walking or running the way they do? 
why is that so efficient for them when we, when we try to do the same thing, we have great difficulty. Our feet are flatter. We don't have that uh, mid tarsal break in our foot uh, that they have, I guess. And so we can't, we can't navigate steep, uh, rocky, rough terrain like they do, and they do it with great ease. And so I, I just don't know how, how that, um, that the way they're built, how that, how that really, um, how that really, you know, how, how, how advantageous that is, yeah, how you know, to, to, yeah, yeah. It's, it seems to be pretty efficient, you know? Yeah, I think uh, I can tell you from my own encounter, their knees aren't in the same place as our knees. Their knees are about where our shins are at. And I, I think, think so. the only thing I can really tell you, uh, if you needed to drop down all fours, that would be more beneficial for you if your knees, you know, because human knees are really about 50% up the leg. And when we get down on all fours, we all get down on all fours the same way. Uh, it's slow, it's clumsy, it's, um, and I think their knees being more in the shin placement they're able to drop quicker. And um, uh, one question I wanted to ask you, did you yeah. ever regret not telling your dad what you saw that day? Did, did you ever have any regret now in life, later in life, not talking to him? Because maybe he yeah. saw something. Maybe he... Maybe he did. I, I wanted to... When, 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 that, when that hog meat that he had hung up there on, that, on those hooks, when that came up missing, I wanted, I wanted to tell him. And I, and I, and I just didn't. And, um, and I, I never told, I never told, I never told anybody until about a month ago, my, my wife, I, I'm, I'm laying in bed with my headphones on and it's about, you know, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. I'm laying in bed and, uh, my wife is, you know, out there reading or whatever she's doing. And so I'm, I'm listening to your show, one of your shows. And, uh, and so she comes to bed and she's a Facebook person, you know, she's a, I got to get her into a 12 step program and get her off that thing. But I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> you know, I don't think it's going to work. But anyway, she gets in bed and I take my headset off because the end, the, your episode is over. And I said, um, she said, what are you listening to? And I said, I'm listening to this podcast about Sasquatch. Oh, well, you know, eyes are rolling, you know, all kinds of strange facial, you know, expressions, you know, she doesn't believe she thinks I'm a kook when it comes to that. And I said, can I tell you a story? And she said, well, okay, sure. Go ahead. So I tell her this story of my encounter and she just looked at me like I was from Mars, you know, it, it just didn't, it didn't, it didn't ring a bell with her. She does. She doesn't believe she just, she, I don't know if she believes in the Nephilim, you know, I don't know. I don't know if she believes in fallen angels. She's a Christian, just like me. I don't know if, I don't know what her belief system is. I've never really, really uh, explored that with her, but I kind of regretted telling her the story because she just, she just doesn't have a belief system that can handle, handle that kind of stuff. You know, she just, she just thinks that all people are imagining that stuff or making it up. I don't know what she thinks, you know, but, um, yeah. And I think some people feel that way until I, and my only recommendation would be to listen to a couple shows. Cause what you'll find over time is everyone from cops to firefighters, to, um, government officials, to school teachers, to hunters, hikers, house moms, they're all describing the same thing. They all run into the same thing. I mean, for the most part, there is small differences. Like we were talking about earlier, uh, some people will say, what I saw was an ape. It, it appeared to be an ape. Uh, but the description is the same. Um, or I saw a very large, tall chimpanzee-looking thing. And, but the overall details are there. And some people will say, well, I saw a very tall, it looked very human-like. Uh, the body didn't look human, but the rest of it did. And, you know, there ha there can't be that many crazy people out there imagining They're seeing not. this. You know what I mean? No, we're not crazy. Definitely, you know, I, definitely. if you look, if I, if I had to, if I had to compare that face to anybody, it's like, you remember the kind of the, uh, the, um, uh, oh, the kind of weathered, uh, um, heavily wrinkled, uh, suntan face of like Geronimo or, one of those, one of those Indian uh, chiefs from the 
mid you know midwest yeah you know that's kind of that's kind of uh in the area that's the, the facial features are going in that direction you know it's 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 human it's a human looking face and uh very 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 dark brown um skin um big eye, big brown eyes sunken back a little bit you know kind of a heavy brow a ridge stuff like that but um not uh, no chimpanzee no great ape uh nothing like that and this creature that i saw never uh, went on all fours never even began to do that and and i don't know why they do that um i don't know why they drop i know some people on your show have said well it dropped down on all fours to navigate through uh dense brush and and brambles and briars and stuff like that but when it got in more open spaces it 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 ran upright but this this never did anything like that I'm so glad that you shared it. I I love older encounters. I absolutely love them because this was a time where there was no Patterson Gimlin film. There, no one was talking about Bigfoot, you know. And unless you were talking to the Native Americans, you probably had no clue what this thing was. Um, what do you think yeah. that they are, Norm? What What's your your opinion after all these years of thinking about this experience? What What do you think that Sasquatch is? Well. You know, if you're if you're a Christian and you believe in the Bible, then you know all the creatures on the earth put here by by you know the, the uh, by God. And for I I for the life of me, I have no idea what the purpose of this creature is. You know, um, it it looks you know I I I, I read um, some information about some DNA testing that Melba Ketchum did. And, you know, part of the DNA that comes back is human. The other part on the, on the male side, the father's side of the DNA, unknown. So some creature like this may very well have, I mean, the Indians talked about how these things would come into their, into their camps and steal their women and children. And what they did with them, uh, I can't imagine something that huge could could mate with a human being, but maybe it's possible. Um, and maybe that's where this, um, this these facial features uh, come in because there's some kind of crossbreeding uh, with with this creature that that uh, that in cases where there may not be that kind of crossbreeding, they look, they look completely different. They have a completely different, uh, face, just like Patty. She had a really, really, um, heavy, um, kind of, kind of uh, facial features, real heavy, you know? And, um, and this, this thing that I saw, it, it, it had a, it had a human type face, you know, the, the nose, the lips, you know, that, uh, and when it, and when it smiled or whatever you want to call it, grin or whatever that creepy thing that it did as it went by us, uh, it never curled its lips or anything like that. It didn't do that. You know how apes, I mean, they'll curl their lip, you know, they want to show you some teeth and that's kind of a intimidation thing. But I don't think this thing was ever, it wasn't really trying to intimidate us. It was just kind of trucking on by and just looked at these three, three little little guys, these little teenagers, you know, 12, 12, 13, 14 years old, and just thought, you know, there's no, there's no hazard here. You know, he just kind of smiled as it went by, like, hey, what's going on? I, it's just creepy, just, just creepy. I don't know what they are, you know, but they, they are, they are, a, you know, when you talk about man is supposed to be in charge or, or over all animals, earth on the earth in the sky in the water in the and clearly we are not in control of this thing this thing this thing rules its uh, domain and we have no we can't even come close to this thing unless we've got some high powered rifles and they have a real history of uh, encountering us with uh, with rifles and it it really it really upsets them 
I guess. And, uh, you know, I guess it, I mean, I, I can imagine, but like any, any ape or any humanoid kind of a creature, they, they learn by observation. And so after centuries of encountering us, trying to shoot at them and killing them, they're, uh, they want to avoid us. And when they encounter us, they want to intimidate us, scare the hell out of us, so we'll go away. And uh, some cases, we, you know, people get bluff charged, and sometimes people just like me, they, it, they don't. So, yeah, it's so hard you know, to- it, so- I don't know. I believe in the Nephilim, you know. I don't know about the – I'm not so sure about the, what happened over in Iran or Afghanistan or where it is where they – supposed to encounter the uh that great uh that great monster up there but you know you read about these uh, these these monsters and i think you had a guy on your show uh quite a few times duke and he talked about these critters up in uh, alaska and they're nothing like what's down here in the in tennessee or texas or the northwest they're completely completely different kind of uh critter much much bigger and m- much more aggressive, I guess, more dangerous. Yeah, you know? it is. It's so hard to know what these things are. I, I tend to agree with you. I don't think that they're the Nephilim. If you really research the Nephilim, the Nephilim were gods and kings, and very different from running around yeah. in the woods. Right. right. That's not to say there's not some weird connection there. I, you know, and I don't know. I'm just. I'm not trying to take away from that because there could be a weird connection to to that. Uh, but your traditional Nephilim were gods and kings. You know, that's where we get most of, even in Greek mythology, m- most of their gods they talk about, the half human, half gods, they were talking about Nephilim that supposedly lived at one time. Uh, but it is so hard to understand what these things are because there is this weird human element uh, to it. And uh, I've tried hard to get Melba Catron to come on the show. And, you know, there's no trap for her to come on. And I just want to hear what she has to say. Honestly, I just want, I, I'm a student of all of it. She doesn't want to come on, but I, I would love to have her come on because Melba was a very uh, respected scientist. And all of a sudden she gets into Bigfoot. And now she's a big joke. Well, why, why is that? Why is it all of a sudden she gets into Bigfoot? And she's a big joke now. It makes no sense. Prior to her looking into Sasquatch, she was very well respected. I mean, she was an expert. They would call to, court cases and everything else and i think it's important to stop and listen to what she has to say because whether you agree with it or not it's irrelevant i think it's important to hear what she has to say and and my hopes on her coming on uh because you know i'm just short of a neanderthal myself and i'm not on any (laughs) level level as far as what she's talking about but i i had hoped that she would come on and kind of dumb down the science for uh people listening to understand what she did, you know, and, and make up their own mind as far as I think she probably, she may very well regret, uh, the direction she took with her laboratory, but she, she sent blind samples to, uh, a number of well-respected, uh, university, uh, labs. And they came back with the same results as she had. And when she told them what it was, they completely disavowed their work They've never seen this before. They never received anything or whatever. They com- they completely retreated from that when they found out what she did, you know. But they come up with the same results as she did, I guess. And, uh, you know, half human, half half something else. What's the other half? I, I have no idea. It, it has, you know, humanoid, you know, uh, homo sapien kind of features, sort of. Uh, but it's, um, so much more it's powerful. Uncomfortable. Isn't it, it uncomfortable is. hearing that? Because wouldn't you have been more happy having her come back and go, yeah, it's a great ape. We haven't caught up with last summer, last summer. My, uh, I took my wife up to a place in East uh, Tennessee called, uh, McLeod mountain lodge. It's got this gorgeous panoramic view of the, of, of the valley below and you can look off and see a river, and you can see part of uh, of uh, uh, Norris Lake and all this stuff. It's really gorgeous up there. There's nothing up there but the lodge and its restaurant. Uh, 
So we ate in the restaurant. It was excellent food. We spent a night in the in the lodge, gorgeous, great big rooms. You know, it was all just a really great experience. And so the following morning, we, I had I had taken my pickup. Um, I had just bought a new pickup, so I thought I'd just drive it. And uh, so when we were leaving the compound, and it was like a compound because it was surrounded by uh, a stucco wall that was about 10 feet high. And on top of that was some barbed wire. And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. But anyway, as we were going out the, out the gate of the compound, heading, heading home, there was a sign, a kind of a, some, a made up sign, and it was stuck in the ground and it said something about a skywalk overlook or something like that. And I thought, well, what is that? So maybe, so I, I turn right and I take, I go up this uh, paved road about maybe half a mile. Then it goes to dirt and I go about another half mile, three quarters of a mile. Now it go. Now I got to put the truck in four wheel drive to get over these ruts and all this stuff. And so we end up going up to this beautiful overlook that looks out over all this panoramic scenic stuff. And there's somebody had gone up there and made these walkways that go out on this rocky bluff so that you can walk out there and you can just see in all directions. Beautiful. Took took a million pictures. So we get back in the truck and we're leaving. And we're going kind of crawling along this road, you know, because just before you get to where you go into the into the overlook, it was pretty, pretty rough road. The ruts are pretty, pretty deep. Uh, two wheel drive truck have, have some trouble in there. So we're going real slow. And I, I saw something out of the corner of my left eye and I just kept driving. And then uh, I, I remembered a conversation that I had with Kathy Strain about Sasquatch. And so I stopped and I backed up and what I saw was a, uh, like a foot trail that was going through just, just, uh, to my left, the, the, the hillside, it was kind of, it kind of flattened out, but then for about maybe 75 or a hundred feet. And then it kind of started, um, a very short climb for about maybe a couple of hundred feet. And that was the top of the mountain. And you could see this trail that went through the went through the woods. There was a tree. I got out of my truck and I walked over there. I took my cell phone out. I took a picture of this thing. And I, this tree was about maybe a six or seven, uh, eight inch tree. It was completely pushed over. It was right beside the trail. It was pushed over and the root ball was sticking up. And then right beside it, was a sapling of maybe three or four inches and about 10, 12 feet off the ground, maybe just a little bit higher. It was broken off at a 90 degree angle and then it was twisted. And I thought, okay, that's, that's mother nature doesn't do that. And, and then the third thing that was right there was another sapling of about maybe two or three inches. It was bent over in an arc and the top of the tree was jammed in the in the in the soil, and it it anchored that tree in an arc. So we got these three trees that something has been playing around with, and so I took a picture of it, and I sent it to uh, Kathy Strain, who is a anthropologist in in Central California in, uh, for the U.S. Department of Forestry. And um, she's an anthropologist and she, you know, does work with the Indian tribes when they discover remains up there and things of that nature. So anyway, she's I consider her kind of a, an expert on this subject, I guess. Now she's seen these things so many times that uh, so I sent her this um, this picture and I say, what is this? And she, she wrote back, you know, pretty quickly that that's a Sasquatch trail marker. Ah, OK. So that's what I saw. So that was in a pretty remote part of um, of Tennessee, and we were not that far from the Kentucky state line where where all this took place. So, pretty. I thought that was pretty fascinating too. Yeah, it is. It's really yeah. fascinating, you know. And I don't yeah. think you have to go too far out to run into these things. You know what I mean? Nope they're 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 around here. I mean, when Dave Pilates, you know, he writes. He writes these 411 books and he, he writes, he's written a lot about the Smoky Mountains around Cades Cove and in that area and how this little boy was just out there 
uh, playing in the grass in this open field. And a few minutes later, he's gone. And they and a huge manhunt is 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 uh, amassed. And they tried to find this little guy, and there was not a not a sign of him. And that just so these these critters. I call them critters. These Sasquatch things. They're very elusive. They can. I think they can camouflage very well, and I think they can almost hide in plain sight. People don't really know what they're looking at. They look at these things and they think it's just a a pile of brush or a rock, or or part of a tree or something. They just they they just blend in, and unless they move or do something, you know, like that. You know, and the human eye is trained to, to catch movement. Anything that moves, we, it, it, we're, we're basically, we can see it. If it's stationary, not so much. You have a hard time maybe f- trying to see it. But if it moves, humans are going to see it. And we have this innate ability to, to know when somebody's looking at us and, you know, when we're, we're in danger. I guess it goes back to when we were, you know first came to this, you know, first created or something. And, uh, we were given this uh, ability, which I guess most of us have, but don't use very often, but some people do when you get that creepy feeling and the hair on the back of your neck stands up and you know that you don't want to go too much further in the direction you're going because you're probably going to get, going to get in trouble. And, and a lot of people ignore that. They override that, 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 that feeling, that sense that we have. I mean, I know we have it because I've been standing in a huge crowd of people, hundreds of people. And all of a sudden I get the feeling that somebody is staring at me. And guess what? I have been able to turn and look straight at the person that's looking at me and all these people. It's just, it's a weird sense that we have if we, you know, kind of let ourselves go with it no you're right i mean uh when i had this yeah yeah when i had rocky elmore on who was a former retired border patrol agent they were taught uh, to hide off in the bushes and as the people pass by don't look at them look at the ground and the reason for that is because there's this weird sense you can get from someone looking at you and it'll give away the border patrol's position so they were told to look at the ground as the people went by, don't look at the people, look at the ground. Uh, it's very bizarre, isn't it? I would love to see case it, studies on it that. It is. And that encounter that they had that night where that critter was out in the water, you know, stalking a couple of those Border Patrol agents, that, uh, you know, those, those guys go out in the middle of nowhere. And where do these creatures hide in the, in the, out there where the, where vegetation is grows so low, you know, where do they hide? Where do they camouflage them? Yeah. So are they maybe they just lay on the ground? You know, I don't know. I don't know how they, uh, I don't know how they hide, you know, hide, they're hiding in plain sight. Generally, I, I would suppose, I mean, in some cases, you know, people almost stumble over these things. It's yeah, uh, your, your questions are my questions, Norm. I thought that too, when I went out there, I thought, where in the world would you ever hide out here? Um, but yeah, they, where? they do run into them. Border Patrol absolutely they do. runs into these things they, out there. And know. they, you know, they've got, they've got military grade, uh, night vision. And so they can see, they can see pretty well. And, uh, there's a lot of stuff moving around out there in the desert that, uh, that the border patrol just doesn't want to talk about. You got to, you got to retire before you can really talk about it, I guess. Yeah, it's true. Love well, like anything else. I would, I would imagine. Well, it's like the California highway patrolman, you know, the area that they most often see Sasquatches around, uh, Truckee, you know, just right on the border of Nevada and California and interstate 80, where these things, they, they see these things crossing the road and, uh, they see these things in that area. You, you would, you never hear anybody on the highway patrol ever openly talking about that stuff it's a career buster really it just it it won't get you uh you know if you're if you're an officer looking to become a sergeant um start talking like that you might not make it you know yeah no doubt probably send you for a psychiatric evaluation (laughs) you know stuff like that you know 
Well, it's like anything else. I think in the military, a lot of guys after they retire, I mean, I'll hear all sorts of stories uh, after they retire. Same thing with pilots. Pilots are afraid their license are going to be taken away. I've talked to so many pilots off the air that have seen these things when they're landing and taking off and they see these things, but you don't dare talk about it because they'll take your your wings away. You know, you won't be able to fly I thought, anymore. I thought the encounter that you put on your, um, on your show with the... Um, with the with the uh, uh, electrical uh, the, le- uh, the 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 power line guys, where yeah. they, had a, they had a pilot and they had a they had an elect uh, a guy that w- they were inspecting uh, power lines and flying through a remote part of uh, Utah. I mean, I guess it would take a day and a half or so to just hike into this place. And guess what? In this the 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 the, the passenger. He saw this thing first. The pilot didn't see it because the console in the in the aircraft was blocking it. And when he rotated the aircraft around, hey, there it was. You know, uh, I think there was a female, uh, uh, as I remember, in a in a uh, juvenile, and then this great big alpha male. And the alpha male just kind of stood his ground until you know, and the other two just kind of wandered off into the into the into the forest or something. They, um, they, they, sometimes they, they seem that they, they want to scurry away and get the heck away from us. And other times they seem like they, they want to stand their ground and they have no fear. Unpredictable. Very unpredictable. Yeah, they're very unpredictable. I mean, it is so unpredictable. You, you can't, uh, I've listened to hundreds of your shows and, and I, I, I just cannot come up with a, with a, a pattern uh, for these things because they're just there's different types i don't know everybody says there's like four different types there might be more i don't know but um you know these police officers that you know went went up there they're gonna do hunting or hiking on the Adira- uh on the um in Adirond- yeah i know what you're talking about yeah, the Adir- yeah. yeah in the adirondacks and uh up there on that in the remote and they ran into these things and they were kind of warned, I guess, by, you know, forestry workers that were up there repairing the, the trail. And they encountered this thing, and they never wanted to go back up there again because they had the, they had the crap scared out of them. I mean, these guys that are in hunting stands that where a, a Sasquatch comes over and reaches up, you're 20 feet in the air or, or more, and it reaches up and it touches your boot with a finger. I mean, you piss your pants. I mean, you yeah. crap yourself, you know? I mean, and that's most just do, most do. crazy. Yeah, it is, and it just goes to show. You've some crazy encounters on your show. I mean, some really, <laughs> really fascinating stuff. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Norm, and, and sharing, hey. sharing what happened to you all those years back. I I really enjoyed talking with you, and I enjoyed hearing uh, the account very much. And it's all little pieces to a puzzle, and if everyone shares, we can kind of get a big picture on what's going on. Uh, but I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and share your encounter. Not a problem. You want to come to Tennessee and go hog hunting? I think I might be able to uh, set that up, and you can just stay with us. I might take you up on that. I might take you. <laughs> Drinks are on me. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Not a problem. Thanks again, hey, it's, good, it's good talking to you and uh, enjoy your show. And uh, you do good work. And you, uh, you, could, uh, you, could be, uh, you could be an investigator. You got a good way, with, uh, good way with people. I appreciate it. I appreciate that very much, Norm. You take care now. You take care of yourself, too, as well. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.
it's in danger I like Save me from myself Let me drown in my black lake Let me float away Save me from myself Let me drown Epiphany, bring the short 